Hi, this is Ms. Bahawk. Welcome to the Look Good, Move Well podcast, where you can get fresh ideas for your training, nutrition, and lifestyle to immediately put to use. Listen in with Marcus Philly, the creator of Functional Bodybuilding, and myself. Hi, I'm Marcus Philly, and we're broadcasting from Revival Strength in San Rafael, California. We'll be talking about avoiding burnout, keeping your passion alive for training, and fueling your body and mind so you can look good, move well now, and for years to come. A carport, gym, and a track are all Marcus used to get jacked in his 20s. And if you're a student or on a budget, you're not going to need much more. If you're thinking of setting up a home gym or are limited in your access to equipment, get some ideas for the essential investments. We'll also talk about what Marcus would do differently if he were transported back in time. Get these takeaways for your own training now. Are we starting? Yeah. We're in? We're in! We're rolling. We're deep in this one, right? <laughs> 16, 17... And we're going. And we're going. And we're live. And we are back. Episode lots. Episode mm, 10. 10 ish. Yeah. 10 ish. Hopefully, we don't switch the order on anything. No, we're not. We're keeping, it, <laughs> keeping, it, <laughs> keeping, keeping it consistent. Keep it solid. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, it's been a pretty, uh, pretty solid season so far. I got some pretty good feedback recently. And um, several people have, uh, I don't. Want, I almost said phoned in, but they messaged in, slide right into those DMs, <laughs> say, hey, Marcus, I got an idea for a podcast. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're doing. We're going to hit a couple topics that, thanks to our, our listeners um, and people that are on the, um, the, the World Wide Web, the social media. <laughs> the triple W. The triple dub. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You want to introduce the topic for yeah. for this episode? I really like this one because I know we, uh, we've we discussed nutrition and eating on a budget before, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but um, mm-hmm. you know I think training is just as valuable. The question that we received was from somebody who was 21 years old. Yeah. Uh, he was considering, you know, oh, maybe I should start like a home gym, but that's going to cost me like over $2,000. Yeah. Is it worth it? Is it a good idea? Um, it also seems like he's on um, the path of becoming a coach as well. So he was curious around, you know, what type of training were you doing when you were his age? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, did you have a home gym? Is it a good idea? And and how would you recommend that he navigates, you know, whether it's financially or, or just being smart about how he's investing his time and energy uh, into training? Yeah, that's so, so cool. Should we give him a little shout out for his Instagram handle? Oh, we should. Come on, look it up. It was a while back, and okay. I know I, I, I did a screenshot. Yeah, it's uh, Brady D9. At Brady D9. Thank yeah. you for your uh, message. Um, let's see, 20 years old, roughly? 21. 21? Yeah. Sort of start with just where, where were we at at 21? <laughs> <laughs> uh. I mean, when I was 21, I was I was in a CrossFit gym. Okay. Uh, but I do, and and you know, at the time, it was definitely a bit of an expense to even be a part of a CrossFit gym. Mm-hmm. Um, I just remember, and I remember actually when I first joined the gym, that was something like I originally went for the seven day trial. And I was like, all right, we're going to pick up as much as we can in these seven days, and we're out. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's no way we're signing up. And uh, after that first, you know, session, I was like, all right, how are we going to make this happen? And then yeah. my brain just went, like, oh, I got to get a client, got to do this, got to do that, and then figured out a way to make it happen. Yeah. But that's kind of what I remember. Yeah. Um, well, 21 was a little longer uh, ago for me. <laughs> so I just turned 34. So let's see, 13 years ago puts us in 2005. Yeah. Is that right? Mm Mm-hmm. There were not too many CrossFit gyms back then. No. I was deep into college. I was a third-year student and um, learning strength and conditioning uh, through, like, NCAA model. What's interesting, however, is that I was definitely training with some of the, you know, some of the same things we use today. Um... And it was around 2005 that I started to get out of like a formal training environment like the Division One athletic program 
and sort of started to like play with my own training models and um, combining some programs or following some Polican method stuff. That was like, that was a pretty groundbreaking year for me. Um, did my first German body comp, you know, training, German volume training, uh, started implementing some sprint work, actually got introduced to kettlebells that year, hmm. um, started to, yeah, mess around with some strongman stuff, found like a, a heavy tire, doing some tire flips and some things like, like that. Um, and that was with a buddy in college and we were, we actually were working out in his, in his carport over in Berkeley. Carport. Carport. Carport's like an open air garage. So there's no oh, enclosure. Oh, I know there's what you're just, talking about. Yeah, you yeah. know, like, car, okay, yeah. Um, more common around here, not in, not in Pennsylvania, I'm guessing, because <laughs> yeah. it's so cold and you need a garage. <laughs> but, like, here, you like, it doesn't get so cold. You can park outside. You just don't want it to be, like, exposed to the rain all the time. Right. Um, so, yeah, we, we, he had, like, he had, like, a, he had an adjustable dumb, uh, kettlebell back then. It was totally sketch because it was like basically like a plate loader like a like the like a sled you know like you load plates like up on a sled yeah. but it had like a pin and then a handle that like was the pin oh so like gosh. it was just kind of these like dangling you know plates at the end of a handle and you were swinging them around wow. um granted we weren't really doing anything like crazy with it we were just kind of learning how to do like russian swings yeah. and then uh and then he had a, a barbell, like a real, real, you know, beater barbell with some uh, metal plates. And we were doing, like, cleans with the metal plates. That was what we were trying to do, to, like, dropping metal plates on the... You were dropping the plates? I mean, I don't even I mean, I don't even know what we were doing. <laughs> there was no chalk. There was just a crappy bar that didn't spin some metal plates and, and concrete. Um, but, yeah, so, and... But yeah, to the question of like, what was I doing for training back then? It was like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, we lifted weights in the, in like a, the school gym, which was, you know, at the time, just like your basic global box gym. Mm -hmm. Um, we did mainly free weights and it was a body part split kind of thing for a number, almost a year. Um, there was a leg day, there were two leg days. There was like a upper body push and pull day and then an arm day with some shoulders um but it was structured like some of the polican german volume training where it was like 10 sets up front a superset of two big lifts and then three three sets of a superset of of uh some like more comp like accessory movements i suppose it was mm -hmm. four lifts a day but it was like an hour and a half of training it was it was intense um, and then on Tuesday and Thursday, we would go to the track. This is, this is like our kind of off day where we would do other stuff. So we'd go to the track and we'd do sprints. We had a variety of different sprint drills where it'd be like, it was really like a lactic power work <laughs> and yeah. where we were just, uh, you know, 10 second high effort upstairs on the, on the field walk back recover rest you know and and interestingly enough over time we sort of progressed through some energy systems without just knowing we were doing it we were just kind of doing it by feel so like you know adjusting rest periods and rest periods would get shorter as the distances got a little bit longer um and we were you know adjusting effort so we weren't like going full out we were going like 90 percent and mm -hmm. But that would be what we did Tuesdays and Thursdays. It was just like sprint at the track. It was like an hour of sprint work. Wow. And then um, then, the, then we found the tire at the, at the track, and we started to flip that as like a little fun thing to do. And then we would like be at his house on the weekend after we'd be at the gym, and we'd play around with some of the cleans and the things that he had. So that lasted a long time. And uh, I honestly did that up until I injured myself. Um, from basically following that training regimen on a 2,000 calorie diet uh, for over a year. So I was undernourished for a long time because I, I basically cut and got super lean and I was like, dude, this is the best thing in the world. I never want to be not this lean. And I only know one way to do it is to eat 2,200 calories a day, hmm. you know? And so I just kept doing that. Super low fat, high protein, high carb. Um, 
And I, my body basically just never got replenished after my initial cut. I needed to do like a, a rebuilding, you know, phase where I just upped my nourishment and, uh, and then deloaded on my training. And I, I didn't have any awareness about that stuff. So, um, ultimately that plus some stress in my life led to my back injury, <clears throat> which then got me totally derailed for the better part of a year after that, where I was like struggling to get back into great shape and, mm-hmm. Subsequently found CrossFit after all that shenanigans. <laughs> wow. You stumbled across so much during that time period. I mean, I'm, I was, I'm really grateful for my training history. It's like, I don't even, I'm lucky that I got exposed to as many things as I did. You know, um, starting from like when I was a teenager, my cousin was showing me, you know, strength conditioning principles, bodybuilding principles from Pollockin that were like legit. And then stumbling across other art. <clears throat> articles and authors in, um, you know, T Nation and um, reading about P- Paul Check early on and reading about Pollockin and reading stuff from John Berardi when he was writing training and nutrition articles back in the day. Um, I mean, he was, you know, strength strength conditioning, you know, specialist and right. had a little nutrition thing on, on the side that was, you know, his interest. Um, but yeah, that was like, that was the background. And I guess coming back to um, the topic and the question is that, you know, how would I approach that now if I was going to start all over again? And, you know, the the amazing thing about companies like Rogue Fitness and, and really the equipment, equipment manufacturers today is that they've made it so affordable to get stuff. Um, if you have a space, if you have like a garage or, or a yard or something and, and you really want to do something on a budget, you know, investing in a actually investing in your own equipment can be more cost effective over time than um, you know joining a a fitness program or a gym uh, potentially Mm -hmm. you know I mean the equipment that's being offered today is so it's so well manufactured that it's gonna last a long time and I think that having you know even even a small amount of equipment that you have access to that you can use on a regular basis and then um, investing some money into some into some coaching of some form that you can at the time and that might just be like you go and attend a seminar or you buy an online course or you buy an online training program and then you just become a student of whatever it is you're doing for a period of time and learn and learn and learn and then when finances are available you know you can upgrade your coaching service to something that is a little bit more uh, holds you accountable more, teaches you more, and then takes more of the responsibility off of you to learn. You can accelerate your progress that way. The good news is that all the equipment that you ever buy for your home gym, I mean, it's all still usable. And I just think the flexibility of being able to work out from home whenever you, you know, whenever it fits your schedule is really of value. And um, it's all, it's been my life, it's been my adult life dream to have a garage gym that was well equipped ever since I basically became aware that I could have such a thing and uh, I still to this day don't have that <laughs> don't have a garage I've owned two or we've we've me and my wife have lived in three different homes uh, two one two homes in a condominium and, and none of them have had a garage <laughs> the one that we have now has like a an oversized closet which is the garage and we can fit some equipment in there um but it's you know which which i'm spoiled i have this great facility here that i get to come and train at um and for most people listening what we have is our our glorified closet garage would be a great home gym Mm -hmm. um it's just not it's it's not the the perfect vision of what I always thought it might be. Yeah. Um, but in a pinch, it's so it's super valuable. And so we have that there and that equipment is super solid and it's not going to go anywhere and it's not going to like deteriorate. We're going to have it for 10, 15 years. And I, our lifestyle allows for us to also have access to a facility. So, um, yeah. Well, first let's start with, uh, maybe in order what you think would be, like highest value items right so um you know something like hey do we start with a barbell and some plates do we start with uh something like a rowing machine or an aerodyne um 
how would you kind of structure that for yourself? Like, I'm assuming we would choose pieces of equipment where it would open you up to a wide variety of exercises mm, and yeah. and movements. So, like, you know, maybe a GHD machine is later down the list versus exactly. something like a, like a barbell, right? Yeah, I mean, we're gonna uh, you you hit you you hit the nail on the head. It's it's like what are the most versatile tools and how can we you know maximize the variety and variation that we can have in a training based upon buying the right devices so um, you know if we look at kind of the the typical loading objects that we have we've got barbells dumbbells and kettlebells and yes i know that there's other things out there we can throw in medicine balls and sandbags to the mix of those um my I would say that the priorities would be kettlebells first. And the reason being is that kettlebells are extremely versatile in what you can do with them. Um, pretty much every movement pattern can be touched on with a kettlebell. Um, we're obviously big fans of unilateral training. And, you know, with kettlebells, you have that, that option as opposed to a barbell. Um, and... The, the weight, uh, the what's the, what's the, oh yeah, like the the weight increases or the the weight um, denominations in the kettlebell world are such that you know you can cover a relatively big range of of total load with fewer kettlebells because they go up in like increments of nine pounds, whereas yeah. dumbbells go up in increments of like five pounds typically. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think that that's a really great investment. The reason I also like that over dumbbells is um, because pretty much everything you can do with a dumbbell, you can do with a kettlebell. And everything you can do with a kettlebell can't necessarily be done correctly with a dumbbell. Mm -hmm. Everything from swings to snatches, etc. Like there's a, you know, there's something about that pendulum nature that you get with the hip hinge on a kettlebell that it's difficult to, to get with a dumbbell. So I, I think dumbbells are a later down the line option. I think that they're a great tool. I would love to have a full set of dumbbells in my garage along with a full set of kettlebells. Um, but I'd probably start with kettlebells. And then the, the next implement that I would get, and, and this really depends on where you see yourself going with fitness. You know, if you want to be doing heavy resistance training of some sort, uh, power lifting, um, if you want to see yourself loading, your, uh, loading up beyond, you know, 100 to 200 pounds in, a, in any movement, then you're going to want to invest in a, a barbell most likely. You know, um, difficult to, to load um, that heavy with kettlebells because you're just going to be limited in a lot of the movements by your shoulder and scapular stability. If you want to develop great leg strength, core strength, you know, back strength, um, barbell is going to be a great tool. And the barbell is also, um, you get a lot of mileage out of like the the basic set of weights, right? So, you know, a basic barbell, um, you don't need to get a super fancy barbell and, you know, some some low grade kind of bumper plates, you know, the, the total cost on that is gonna give you a ton of options in terms of what you can do in tr uh, for training. So I like those two as loading options. So yeah, again, it's like dumbbells might come later in the, in the down the line. So. You know, if you're a, a male or female athlete starting out in a garage gym, you want to get yourself a, you know, a, I guess it's the, the 9 kilo or no, the 8 kilo kettlebell. Mm -hmm. Then you want to get a 12 kilo and then a 16 and probably, a, you know, the next one up a 20. So you get like the lighter ones first. And then every few months as you're getting stronger, you're adding another kettlebell or you're doubling up. You're getting two of the 20 kilos or two of the 24 kilos. That's going to give you different options to do double you know, double front rack loaded stuff, double kettlebell swings, double cleans, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, when it's time to invest in a barbell, put the money into it, you know, like get the full set. And this is an area that's like, you don't have to get a nice bar, but if you, if you spend the money up front and buy like a, a decent bar and a decent set of weights, they're gonna last a really long time. If you get, if you go too cheap on that stuff, they can break down and you're gonna end up wanting to upgrade later anyway. Um, as far as the, the, I talked about medicine balls and sandbags. Um, I, I don't think it's too valuable to, uh, yeah, yeah, like buy a bunch of different size medicine balls. I just don't think they're, um, 
they're variable uh, enough in terms of what you can do with them. I think having one light, light-ish medicine ball would be a nice option for doing slam ball rotational tosses, various ballistic type throws mm -hmm. with the ball. So something in like the 15 to 20 pound range and buy one of the, the D balls, the ones that have like, you know, they're rubber, they have heavy sand in it and they kind of have a dead stop to them. They don't bounce too much. You can even do wall balls with, with that type of medicine ball. Um, but if you buy one of the bigger round fluffy ones, you know, it's great for a wall ball, but then when you try and slam it on the ground, it doesn't really work as well. So I would have a, a light D ball. And then I would invest in a, in a heavy sandbag for where your fitness is at. Um, a sandbag that you could load up with 100 pounds or 50 pounds or 200 pounds. Um, and the reason being is that that tool right there is uh, just such a potent training device that you can also use for a variety of different movements and the, the loading of a sandbag as you pick it up is so unique to barbells and kettlebells and everything else it's just a you have to wrestle those things whereas kettlebells and barbells fit nicely into positions on your body mm -hmm. so that's how I would handle that and then I would you know the rest is really just a, a small 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 things um you know, a jump rope for jumping rope, a stud bar to attach to the ceiling for pull-ups. Um, ideally, you're going to have a squat rack. Um, and that doesn't have to be, like, you don't have to invest a ton into a, a squat rack. You can find old used ones on Craigslist. Uh, but if you buy the barbell and you're going to do some squat training, it's good to have both a squat rack and a bench of some sort that you can do bench pressing on. And then the, um, yeah, things that might come later down the line would be like a set of rings to hang from your pull-up bar to do dips and different types of push-up variations and planks on. Um, as you're getting, you know, tired of doing just jump rope and running and you want to vary your conditioning options, um, my first, I think my first purchase would be an assault bike. I think the assault bike has a lot of different ways that you can train energy systems on it. It doesn't require a tremendous amount of skill. And um, as opposed to like the rowing machine where you have to learn technique. Uh, and space-wise, it's efficient. Yeah, space-wise, it's relatively efficient. I mean, everything that we na named is very efficient. A squat rack can kind of collapse down into something quite small. The pull-up bar is literally just going to take up the space of that bar on the wall. And then everything else can get, you know, stored to the side of the room. Um, and if I, if I had to guess, if you were going to, like, buy, like, nice stuff, everything new, um, just what I said, you could be under, I guess, with the assault bike. The assault bike's probably, I think it's, like, seven ninety nine or something like that. So probably without that, you're looking at, like, $1,200. And with the assault bike, you're closer to $2,000. And that equipment can be, you know, you could then have someone write you a program or follow a program in almost its entirety with that, you know, set, set of tools for months and months and months to come. Yeah, it's pretty solid. I think uh, it's interesting you picked the kettlebell. Oh, yeah? What would you, where would you have gone? I mean, I, I actually was thinking the same thing, but I thought you were going to say barbell for some reason. Oh, yeah. Um, but kettlebell, I, I, I do agree with you on everything you said around that. It's like, you, there's especially now that there's so much that you can see online, like you're doing Primal mm -hmm. Swolger, like all the different flows that you can do with yeah. just this one thing. Yeah. It just feels effective. And then all these exercises are running through my head when you said barbell. It's like... You could do, yeah, your traditional lifts in the rack, but like landmine presses, yeah, right. oblique twists, yeah, 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 all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, I was gonna say if you buy like a, a hundred dollar landmine attachment, or it's maybe not even that much, you you then have you know, you can do a landmine press without a landmine attachment, but right. it would make it would make it a little bit more fluid and, and easier. Yeah, and 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 uh, with individual coaching this is kind of the cool part is like there's definitely several clients that came to mind where they all work out of their you know garage gym and each of them have a unique set 
you know, uh, equipment pieces. Mm -hmm. And some of them are growing over time and some of them are like, yep, this is kind of where I'm at for now. And, and it just gives you a chance to be creative and, you know, having just a couple things is usually more than enough to get started and, yeah. and roll with for quite some time. Yeah. I mean, I, I do have a remote client who's out in, um, Austin, Texas or in that area. And yeah, I was thinking about him. I mean, he, he doesn't have a barbell in his garage right now. Mm. He just has kettlebells and then a pull-up bar, jump rope, and an assault bike um, and TRX straps, so not even like proper rings. Um, so with that, you know, we're six months into d to design with him, and, and we've got plenty of variation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the second part, let, let's double-check the second part to that question. Um How to afford it if you ever had a home gym. Okay, so we got into what kind of training you were doing. Mm -hmm. um, looking back at it now, would you? how would you start that experience? Let's say you had all these pieces of equipment yeah. that you just mentioned. What would be kind of your start to experimentation? Mm. Good call. Um, well, I, I think that there was definitely something valuable to me getting into a commercial gym for a period of time and doing traditional bodybuilding with a lot of different tools that they had there, you know. I mean, I did machines, I did barbell work, I did dumbbell work, I was doing dips, I, you know. I really had a chance to kind of explore what it meant to do body part focused training where I was like really, and compound lifts, but um, I couldn't have replicated that with the equipment that we just said. So like hamstring curls, leg press, um, a variety of different curl machines and shoulder machines as well as the cables that I was using. Like that stuff taught me some things, which I value. Um, I think I would have probably done a little bit less of that maybe, you know, because I was at a university, so it was like built into my, my you know, tuition. It was like mm -hmm. 75 bucks for a semester to go to this pretty legit gym, so I wasn't going to pass that up. Um, and then I would have had a barbell with some bumper plates and a few kettlebells in the garage to start to experiment with, you know, Olympic lifting, the kettlebell training that we, we see, um, and having that assault bike would have been something I, knowing what I know now, I would have used it a lot to do cardio. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean... I, oh, it's funny when I think back to those years, I always felt best when I was in like a regular routine of doing cardio, even the, even on like ellipticals and, and, you know, machines that people laugh at now. But s there were periods where I did steady state cardio for like 30 minutes a day after my training, my weight training or before. And I always felt better. Mm -hmm. And now I realize today it's like I had a very, I had a moderately developed aerobic system. And I was processing nutrients better because of it. I was recovering faster from my training because of it. Um, and with a more developed aerobic system, people gen just have uh, general feelings of well-being. And and that, um, yeah. If, if I, I mean, I could have done it all on an assault bike. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot easier from my home and. Uh, so that's, and I could have also done the sprint training on the assault bike. So the stuff that we did running could have been done on an assault bike as well uh, with a similar effect. And, um, but I did love me some track days, popping <laughs> the top, getting a little sunshine. <laughs> it was pretty fun. <laughs> I bet. I remember, I remember I quit soccer my final, my senior year and I stayed, I got in the best shape of my life after soccer. So I would mm. be down at the track doing my sprint work with my buddy and and the team would you know the the men's and the women's team would still be down there training and people would just be like dude philly you're you're jacked bro <laughs> like, you're so you're in such good shape i was like yeah man i just had to stop playing soccer and start <laughs> yeah. lifting baby getting some tr some track work in <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing uh there's one part to his question that i feel like we didn't uh get to but something popped to mind he was asking kind of about career advice or mm. how i mean it, it seemed like he was on track to pursuing coaching in some way as well um and, and this is like i don't know if this is off script but this is an alternative that came to mind for me was what if you 
you know, there, there's Planet Fitness, there's like LA Fitness. I don't know how much of it is out here, but there <laughs> are like those types of commercial gyms where you could pay like, I want to say anywhere from 10 to like 20, 30 yeah, bucks no, a month. Inexpensive. And you have access to a, a wide variety of machines and probably free weights at this point too. The remainder of the financing available, if you did some type of individual coaching mm -hmm. where like you could figure out how to do it for a year or six yeah. months at least, that I think those two things would give you a way to see how somebody would design for you, how somebody would, uh, and I think in that relationship, at least the way that we do it, is you could you could actually set it up. So hey, you're gonna get a lot of learning through doing out of this. Yeah. And I feel like that would expedite the process so much faster. Or becoming a professional, yeah. Yeah, or even for your own sake of learning, like you would sure. walk away with so much on, maybe even beyond that, on how to apply it with yourself and or other clients. Yeah, I mean, if I'm gonna give you the roadmap for just what you said, it's like, invest in some of the equipment for yourself and develop a passion by training on your own. I think the ability to train on your own is so key. Learn how to motivate, learn how to stay committed, the investment of money into your own equipment is going to hold you accountable. You're, you're going to be likely to, to say, I want to use this. I just spent a big portion of my finances on my home gym. Then the great news is that the equipment stays fresh and it's not going to go anywhere and it's still usable for years to come and you start to save more money and then it's about making the next investment into yourself. And I believe that there's a point at which you have to decide when am I going to seek out paid coaching, paid advice. I need somebody to guide me. And the sooner you can get to that point with an adequate supply of equipment that's going to fulfill the, you know, the needs of that training, I think the better. As a person who's just going to pursue fitness, you will see results much faster. Mm -hmm. And you will, you will save yourself, you know, and, and that's kind of what I first thought when you were like, what would I have done differently? Um, I would have found an individual coach sooner. They didn't exist really at the time in the way that they do now, but I would have. And, um, and then on the flip side also is as, as you think about, if people are thinking about pursuing the profession of coaching, which I have had three consultations in the last three weeks uh, for new clients that want to work with Revival Strength who are opening gyms or professional coaches or want to be professional coaches and they're looking to enhance their coaching as well as their athletic pursuits um, the combination is extremely important to have a coach and that will also enhance your experience and and your professionalism and your your skill set as a fitness professional too so thanks for the submission yeah, thanks for listening. It was fun to go down that little memory lane. Yeah, any follow-ups, uh, head over to speakpipe.com forward slash look good, move well, or just DM Marcus Philly. Or slide into the DMs. <laughs> you can do it. You can DM Airborne Mine or you can DM me. <laughs> yeah, either one works. Or you can even hit up Revival Strength. I mean, hit it from all different angles. <laughs> yeah. Slide in there. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Thank you.